Do you know that there is only one God in three eternal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you know that Jesus said he is the only way to heaven, and his death and resurrection bring forgiveness of sins to all who believe? Welcome to the Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study God's Word, the Bible, together. Welcome to the Pastor's Study. I tried to find the quote and I couldn't, but I think it was Martin Luther 500 years ago who said, the best defense against heresy, against false teaching, is to know and pray the Lord's Prayer. So today and then the next few weeks, we're doing a series on the Lord's Prayer. Today we'll just get to the words, Our Father, who art in heaven, and we'll do the rest in the coming weeks. But let, let's pray. Father, we pray now as we go through this great prayer that Jesus himself taught us, that you will open our ears and our hearts, open my mouth, and speak to us through the greatest prayer that has ever been prayed. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. First word in the Lord's Prayer is our. Have you ever noticed all the plurals in the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our trespasses. Give us our daily bread. And I think all of those ours and plurals simply means this. Every Christian is part of the church. You're part of the plurality of the church. And if you're not part of the church, are you a Christian? So a lady called me once and, Pastor Brock, I'd like you to baptize my baby. I said, okay, do you go to church here? No, I don't go to church, but I'd like you to baptize my baby. And I said, well, you know, in the baptismal service, you promised that you're going to raise this child in the church. And, and are you willing? No, no, I, the Bible never says you have to go to church. I said, yes, it does. Hebrews 10, 25, do not forsake the assembling of... Well, it didn't go well. <laughs> she maybe went somewhere else, but... Um, every Christian is part of the church. And if you're not part of the church, I'm concerned about your soul. Next thing the word our means is simply, there are no Lone Ranger Christians. You cannot know God deeply all by yourself. You need your Christian brothers and sisters to help you truly know God. So our means... Every Christian is part of the church. It our means there are no Lone Ranger Christians. I, I did a funeral, and a couple comes up to me afterwards and said, well, you know, we, uh, uh, we don't go to church, but we watch it on television. And I thought, can you serve a TV set? You know, one of the reasons you go to church is not just to get, but to serve and to give. You can't serve a TV set. You can't get Holy Communion out of a TV set. There are no Lone Ranger Christians. The other thing I think the word our means, no excuses. Well, pastor, I don't go to church because 15 years ago, the pastor did something and said something that offended me. Well, can you forgive and get over it? Later in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, as we forgive those who trespass against us. I'm sorry, I don't buy this belief that if you get offended by the church, that's your eternal ticket never to go back. That doesn't work on Judgment Day. I've been a pastor many years. Have I ever had my feelings hurt by people in the church? Oh yes, a lot. But you forgive and you keep going to church. And next thing the word our in the Our Father means there is power in group prayer. Again, I hope you pray the Lord's Prayer by yourself, but it's with the plurals, I think it was designed to be prayed with a group, with the church. So I look through the book of Acts, the New Testament history of the very early church, and I ask the question, did they pray in groups in the early church, and what was the result? So listen to this. Acts chapter 1, Jesus ascends into heaven and the disciples pray for 10 days. The result, Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes, 3,000 get saved. Then in Acts chapter 2, there's a group prayer meeting in Acts chapter 2. The results, the fear of God came upon all and there were signs and wonders and miracles. 
Acts chapter 4, another group prayer meeting is going on. The result, and the place was shaken. All were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to witness boldly. Acts chapter 6, uh, there's a prayer for the deacons of the church. And the result, people get converted. Uh, Acts chapter 12, Peter's in prison. They're having a group prayer meeting for Peter. God sends an angel, gets Peter out of jail. Acts chapter 13, they're praying and fasting as a group. The result, the Holy Spirit says, make Paul an apostle, and he evangelizes a lot of the Roman Empire. Uh, Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas are in prison. Uh, they're praying together, and the result, uh, her, uh, an earthquake comes, knocks down the jail, they get saved out of the jail, and the Corinthian jailer gets saved. <laughs> My point is, there is power in group prayer. So pray by yourself, but also be part of a prayer group. Be part of a church where you pray together. So here's what we've learned so far. The word our means every Christian is part of the church. Don't try to be a lone ranger. Don't give excuses. But get into church and experience the power of group prayer. Next word. Our Father. What that word means is everybody needs a father. I was looking at, I was driving by, and here's this uh, bus bench, and it had the advertisement on it, Christian radio station. It said, every family needs a father, dot, 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 which art in heaven. Every Christian, every person needs God the Father. And I think this was St. Augustine in the 400s who wrote, God has created a vacuum-shaped, God-shaped vacuum in every human heart. And people try to put other things in there to get it to fit, but it doesn't fit, it rattles. The only thing that will perfectly fill the God-shaped vacuum in your heart is God the Father. Next thing I want to say about the word God the Father. God the Father is under attack today, even within the church. There is a large, historic Presbyterian church in downtown Minneapolis. They have their worship service on Sunday afternoon. You, from the look of the church, it's mahogany, it's old, big organ, big choir. It looks like the most traditional Presbyterian Church on earth. It is not. The pastors there are very enlightened, and they have decided not to refer to God as He anymore. And you rarely hear, hear God called Father in that church because it's sexist, it's oppressive. It's from Jesus. Jesus. You know, in the Old Testament, there were just a few references to God being our Father. Jesus is the one who put that to the forefront, the concept of God as Father. That comes from Jesus himself, and to get rid of it because you think you're smarter than Jesus Christ is evil. I graduated from Luther Theological Seminary here in uh, the Twin Cities. They brought in a transgender preacher to go to, to chapel. You can see this on YouTube. And he, she got in front of the church and let's pray the Lord's Prayer as you are comfortable praying it. And he, she said, our mother in heaven, hallowed be your name. Well, that's, that's arrogant. That's not what Jesus taught us to pray. And you're not smarter than Jesus Christ. When years ago, when I wanted to get good and angry, <laughs> I would take a slow walk through United Theological Seminary of the Twin Cities. This is a United Church of Christ seminary that trains United Church of Christ pastors, Presbyterian pastors, and Unitarian pastors, all under the same roof, like the Trinity doesn't matter. But I used to go, it, it's a radical seminary. And they used to have like eight big paintings of the divine feminine. And these are all different pictures for the goddess, God. The white buffalo women, woman of Native American spirituality. I mean, it just, then you go to the, the bookstore to see the required reading for class, a lesbian perspective of the New Testament. And I'd always come out of that place. Uh, often I'd have good material for a heresy update, but just angry. Well, you know what happened? They had to sell their building. It's not, they're not there anymore. Somebody else owns the building because these evil denominations that think they're smarter than Jesus Christ, they just shrink and die. It, it still exists, but not in that beautiful building anymore. 
So my point is, if you go to a church where the pastor does not open the service in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but in the name of the Redeemer, Creator, and Sanctifier, I wouldn't go to that church. They're getting rid of Father, Son, Holy Spirit language. And the last words of Jesus on earth was to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We're not smarter than Jesus. Let's stick with his teaching. And the next thing that the word Father means. Father means we can pray intimately. Jesus said we can pray to God as our Abba, which is Aramaic for Daddy. We can pray to God as our Daddy. You know, some people approach God like he's the Wizard of Oz and you just shake. Jesus said, no, no, no. When you come before God, think of him as your Father and you can pray intimately to him. Now, let's ask this question about God the Father. Is God everyone's Father? There's a song we sing at Christmas time. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me, with God as our Father, brothers all are we. Jesus is not mentioned in that Christmas song. And it's kind of this syrupy view of God that everybody is a child of God and God is everybody's Father. <laughs> nope. Jesus said to the Pharisees in, Acts, in John chapter 8, Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. And the Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, we were all children of wrath, of God's wrath. We don't start out as God's children in this world. We're evil. We're children of the devil, children of God's wrath. And that's the next point. God is our father, but only by adoption. You, you can become a child of God. He can become your father, but only through adoption. I get this from Galatians chapter 4, where Paul writes, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were born under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. So no, I'm not a child of God to begin with, but through Christ, faith in Christ, I'm adopted. There's a story that about the year 1900, there was a little orphan boy who sold newspapers in downtown Chicago. Just, you know, grimy, dirty, raggedy clothing. One day this little boy wandered away from downtown and he found himself in the residential rich area of Chicago. And he's standing before this huge green lawn, beautifully manicured lawn. On the top of the hill was this huge mansion. And he thinks, wow, would I like to live in a house like this? And then he, he goes up on the lawn and he thinks, oh, I'd love to play here and not have people chase me away. And before he knew what he'd done, he, he was up on the doorstep and he rang the doorbell. And a, a rather stately gentleman, yes, son, can I help you? Well, mister, do you own this house? Do you live in this house? Why, yes, I do. Oh, mister, what I love to live in a house like this. Do you have a little boy? <laughs> and the man said, no, Mrs. Lowry and I don't have children. And the little boy took seven pennies out of his pocket and said, well, mister, here's all the money I have in the world. I'll, I'll, I'll give you this, and then would you let me come in and, and, and be your boy? <laughs> the story goes that the man calls upstairs, honey, come down here, I want you to see this. Now, very finely dressed woman descends the stairs, yes. Well, this little boy doesn't have a mom or a dad. And he says he wants to become our son. What do you think? <laughs> Story goes they brought him in his ho into their house. That week they went down to the city hall, adopted him as their son. They brought him back into the mansion. They threw away his old clothes. They gave him a bath and gave him a fine education. That little boy on the porch this is a true story, went on to become the prominent physician, Dr. Lucas Lowry, in the city of Chicago. <laughs> and that's what God did for you. When we began life, we were not children of God. We stood on God's porch as grimy sinners, and we didn't have seven pennies to give the Lord. 
But God said, I'll take you in. He brought us into his kingdom. He washed us of our sins through baptism. He gave us a new set of clothes called the righteousness of Christ. And now because of Christ, but only because of Christ, I am a child of God and God is my father. If you have not put your faith in Jesus yet, you need to do that so God can forgive your sins and make you his child. Next words, who art in heaven? Now, those words stress that God is transcendent. He art in heaven. God is separate from his creation. The words our father means God is imminent. He's close to us. He art in heaven, though, stresses that God is separate from us. I think maybe the reason the words who art in heaven are in the Lord's Prayer is to protect us from new age pantheism. I remember years ago watching Oprah and she had the new age writer and actress Shirley MacLaine. And Shirley MacLaine misquoted the Bible and said, Oprah, be still and know that you are God. That's called pantheism. The word pan means everything, theos means God. In pantheism, everything's God. You're God, I'm God, the mountains are God, uh, Oprah's God, everything is God. Buddhism, uh, Hinduism tend to be pantheistic religions. No, no, our Father art in heaven. You don't confuse God with the trees. If you're acquainted with the daily devotional book, Our Daily Bread, I think it's the best one there is. Google it and buy it, because they'll send you every, every month or whatever, their daily devotion, Our Daily Bread. But there's another daily devotional book out there called The Daily Word. And in it, they talk about Jesus, they use Bible verses, but it's from a cult called the Unity Church, which teaches you and I are the collective Christ consciousness. We are all God. No, we're not. All right, so let's summarize. The word our means every Christian is to be part of the church. No excuses. Find a good church and go regularly. And the word father means that he's not the Wizard of Oz. He's your loving, close, tender father. But he art in heaven. He's not you and he's separate from his creation. And I want to close with this. I went to a pastor's conference and one session was called Healing the Heart. And the speaker said, I want you to pair up with somebody that you don't know. So all these pastors around the auditorium sat face to face with, I got some North Dakota pastor that I didn't know. And then the, the speaker said, now I want you to look into the eyes of the man across from you and tell him what you would like to say to your father. People cried. And I, I, the, the North Dakota pastor was more nervous than I was, so I said, do you want me to go first? Yeah, please. And so I did it, and then he did it. But people cried. And the speaker said, the reason I had you do that is your view of God is directly related to any unfinished business that you have with your earthly father. So if you feel God is distant from you, maybe it's because you had a distant father. Because your first impression of God the Father is your father on earth. Some of you had horrible fathers. But we need to understand, I heard an old Presbyterian preacher say this. He said he spoke on the fatherhood of God at a church. After the sermon, a little boy comes up crying well, mister, if God is my father, you, if God is a father, you can keep him. Uh, the preacher said, what's wrong, little boy? Well, my father comes home drunk. He beats up my mother. He hates my brother and I. And if God is a father, you can keep him. And the Presbyterian preacher said, little boy, what would you like your dad to be like? Oh, I wish he would love us and not hurt us and, and take care of my mother and take care of us and protect us. And he went on and, and the preacher said, little boy, that is God the Father. 
So I want you to know when you are praying the Lord's Prayer, you're not talking to some abusive God in heaven. You're talking a father who loved you so much, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would become a loved child of God. You know a hymn I love? It's an old Swedish hymn. Children of the heavenly father, safely in his bosom gather, Nestling bird nor star in heaven, such a refuge e'er was given. Though he giveth or he taketh, God his children ne'er forsaketh. His the loving purpose solely to preserve them pure and holy. So can I ask you to do this? Can we close the sermon time before we get to the question period? Would you pray with me to the Lord's Prayer? Here we go. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name, Amen. And we'll continue on next week. Welcome to the portion of the pastor's study where we ask Pastor Brock questions regarding the Bible. Pastor Brock, mm -hmm. are we supposed to fear God? And can you love God if you fear him? I think we do both. Uh, Luther wrote the Luther Small Catechism 500 years ago for parents to teach their children the Christian faith. And in it, he, he explains the um, Apostles' Creed, and then he does Our Father and goes through the petitions. And, and here's the way Luther did it. Our Father Renette, who art in heaven, what does this mean? We should so fear and love God that we blah, blah, blah. And forgive us our trespasses. What does this mean? We should so fear and love God. Da, da, da. So I think it's proper to both fear and love God. I mean, I love my dad, mm -hmm. and he was not abusive, uh, never beat us in a bad way, but he had a stick in the closet. And when my brother and I acted up, He'd get the stick out. I love my dad, but I feared my dad. Mm -hmm. God can do the same thing. If he, if he has to, God can discipline us. So I think it is possible to fear God and love him at the same time. Totally agree. Yeah. Does the Bible ever refer to God as our mother? There are a few references, like I think it's in Isaiah, where like as a mother comforts her child, so God comforts us. Mm -hmm. There are a few references where, where God is pictured as loving us as a mother does her children. Does, God, does the Bible, Old or New Testament, ever tell us to pray to God our mother? Never. All of the prayers in Jesus' teaching that refer to God as our Father, mm -hmm. there's never God our mother. So we don't do that. Okay. Yeah, well, we shouldn't. We shouldn't. Yeah. Which churches are downplaying God the Father? Yeah, I'll tell you the churches that are now praying to God our mother. Now, not all of the congregations in these denominations do it, but the most left of center of all the Christian denominations is the United Church of Christ. And I visited one of their churches some time ago, and the uh, woman got up and said, let's pray the Lord's Prayer, our mother and father who mm -hmm. art in heaven. So the, the United Church of Christ, the Episcopal Church, the ELCA Lutheran Church, the Presbyterian Church USA, some United Methodist churches, mm -hmm. those are churches, again, not every congregation, plays with mm -hmm. the fatherhood of God. But I've, I've said this on the, I'll, I guess I'll say it real quick. There's a big, large Methodist church across the street from my house. I went there a while ago. Mm -hmm. the, the pastor gets, the Methodist pastor gets up to baptize the child. I baptize you in the name of the one who makes all things and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He got rid of God the Father. Why? Mm -hmm. Well, because it's sexist and oppressive to call God our Father. I put a note in his box. I found his box. He doesn't know me from that. I said, Jesus taught us to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We don't have the right to change that. So if you go to a church where they're praying to God the Mother, I'd head for the hills. <laughs> Does this amaze you that so many churches today yeah. are changing? Yeah, it's just changing? Think, I'm, the mainline liberal Protestant denominations have gone over the cliff mm -hmm. on God language, on homosexuality, on universalism. It's just on abortion rights, mm -hmm. churches in favor of abortion rights. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just tragic. What about God's word? Amen. You know? Amen, Mona. Uh, how do I find a good church mm -hmm. today? Yeah. I just urged people, 
If you don't go to a church, find a good church mm -hmm. and go every week. And all right, but how do you know if it's one of these bad churches that we just mentioned or a good one? It's very easy. You go to the church. After church, I've said this many times, mm -hmm. you go up, Pastor, can I ask you a few questions? I'm church shopping and you do it by yourself and just them. And does this church believe Jesus is the only way to heaven? Does this church believe there's a heaven and a hell? Mm -hmm. A lot of pastors don't believe in hell anymore. Uh, can you tell me what your church teaches about uh, uh, premarital sex, abortion, homosexuality? And if you get good, clear biblical answers, that's a good church. If you get, that's rather complex, and that's mm -hmm. a mysterious, no, no, get, get to another church. Travel on. <laughs> um, should you pray the Lord's Prayer every day? Well, Jesus said, when you pray, say. I, I don't think it's ever instructed that we mm -hmm. have to pray it every day. I think it's a good thing to do, but I don't think you have to do it every day. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Which religions are pantheistic? Yep, we talked about pantheism. Again, pan means everything, theos means God. Everything's God. Mm -hmm. In fact, I remember one of my professors held up the uh, chalkboard, the eraser for the chalkboard. He said, you know, if you were a path and pantheist, you'd be worshiping this. <laughs> because in pantheism, everything is God. Mm -hmm. it, the Buddhists and Hindus tend to be pantheistic. New Age people tend to be pantheistic. And no, no, we don't believe in pantheism. Our mm -hmm. Father art in heaven. He's transcendent. He's mm -hmm. separate from his creation. And one Father. Yes. All right. Uh, what is the New Age movement? The New Age movement is basically, if you go to the uh, Barnes & Noble bookstore, you'll go to the New Age section and see lots mm -hmm. of books about, you know, getting in touch with your inner something or other, and we are all God. You need to get in, in and then they'll, we, we, then they'll throw Jesus into it. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is one of many gurus who taught us how to become God, like he's God and you're God and I'm God. And all of that is false teaching. Mm -hmm. We are not God and we never will be. We are to become like God, but I'm not Jesus Christ and I never will be. The New, New Age movement uh, uh, believes that we're all part of the Christ consciousness. No, we're not. Okay. Do they use the Bible at all? Oh, they'll throw in Bible verses. Like, okay. yeah, it's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What would you say to someone who can't go to church because they experienced abuse by a pastor or a priest? I'd say, oh, I'm so sorry. Please mm -hmm. forgive the church for the horrible thing that happened. I mean, for a pastor to abuse a child mm -hmm. in church sometimes. So just, I would, you know, if you need help, counseling, etc., uh, let's get that for you. But I, I ask your forgiveness. This mm -hmm. was so evil. But come back to church. Get into a good church because most churches are not like that. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, we're almost out of time. Yep. We want to thank you for joining us today on the Pastor Study. Isaiah 40, verse 8 says, The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. To know God, know his word. Read it every day if you can. See you next time on the Pastor Study. Thank you for watching The Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the good news of Jesus Christ because of the generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org or write The Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forever.